Welcome. My name is Molly Ness. I am a teacher educator, author, and associate professor of childhood literacy. Recently, I was elected as an at-large board member of the International Literacy Association. We are so happy that you have joined us for today's exciting event, Tackling Tough Topics Through Middle Grade Literature, sponsored by Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing. We are joined by a wonderful group of panelists this evening, including Barbara D., Supriya Kalkar, Henna Khan, and Donna Gephardt, and we are excited to get the program started. Before I introduce our moderator for this evening, before I introduce the moderator for this evening, to Anne Nguyen, just a few housekeeping notes. There will be time for a Q&A at the end of the panel discussion, so please submit questions via the Zoom questionnaire box, the chat box, or by posting comments on Facebook live stream video. If the chat box conversations become distracting, you can minimize that area of your screen. And if you're tweeting along, please remember to tag ILA at ILA today and use hashtag ILA webinar. If you'd like to rewatch or share this event with a colleague, you may do so directly following the event on our Facebook page. A closed caption recording will be available within 10 days on our YouTube channel. Our moderator this evening is Tua Ann Wynn. Tu is an educator and a writer whose work centers on, on equity and justice. She has taught English, creative writing, and history for almost 20 years most recently at Sidwell Friends School in Washington, D.C. And without further ado, please welcome Tuan Nguyen. Thank you, Molly. I'm very happy to be here this evening. In this ILA webinar, we will be discussing the importance of using fiction to introduce tough topics to middle grade readers. And just so you know, I read these books with my own middle grade reader. And um, it was so fascinating because we were on a trip and he, uh, was talking to her friends of his and he was like, I know what nesting is. I learned about it from reading this book. So thank you, Supriya, in advance for that. And so I think these books are really um, wonderful ways to have conversations with middle grade readers. So I'm very excited for today. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Barbara D. Barbara D is the author of 12 middle grade novels. Her books have received star reviews and have been on many best of lists, including the ALA Notable Children's Books, the ALA Rise, a feminist book project list, and the ALA Rainbow List Top 10. Her most recent titles are My Life in the Fish Tank and Maybe He Just Likes You, Violets Are Blue, will be published on September 28, 2021. Supriya Kalkar was born and raised in the Midwest and learned Hindi as a child by watching three Hindi movies a week. She is a screenwriter who has worked on the writing teams for several Hindi films, and she also writes books for children. Her most recent title, That Thing About Bollywood, published in May 2021. Hena Khan is a Pakistani-American writer. She is the author of the middle grade novels, Amina's Voice and More to the Story, and picture books, Golden Domes and Silver Lanterns, Under My Hijab and It's Ramadan, Curious George, among others. Her most recent novel is Amina's Song, the companion to Amina's Voice, and was published in March, 2021. Donna Gephardt, Award-winning middle grade novels include The Paris Project, Lillian Duncan, Death by Toilet Paper, How to Survive Middle School, and others. She's a popular speaker at schools, conferences, and book festivals. Her most recent novel is Abby Tried and True, which was published in March, 2021. Thank you to members of the panel for joining us this evening. I would like to have each of you give a brief synopsis of your most recent publication and the tough topic that the characters encounter within the story. Barbara, let's have you start us off. Hi everybody, I'm Barbara D. And my next book, um, Violets Are Blue, will be out in September. And it's about a 12 year old girl named Renata who feels as if she has no control over her life. Her parents have just split up. Her mom, who's an ER nurse, tells them that they have to move to a new town. Um, and the way that Renata deals with feeling that she has no control over anything is by 
first of all, changing her name. She becomes Wren with a silent W. And by immersing herself in um, online videos, YouTube videos about special effects makeup. So these are uh, makeup artists who show you how to transform your face into a superhero or an alien or a mermaid. And Ren becomes so obsessed with these makeup tutorials um, that she's spending too much time on it. And her mom tells her that um, she needs to socialize at their new school or she's going to take away Ren's computer. So Ren reluctantly volunteers to do makeup for the middle school production of the musical Wicked. And soon she's so involved in the makeup and the musical that and her new friends and also dealing with a crush from a boy that she doesn't reciprocate that she doesn't notice that her mom's behavior is starting to become troubling. Her mom puts a lock on her bedroom door and spends long hours inside her bedroom and also disappears from the house without explanation for certain periods. Um, her mom is moody or she doesn't feel well. Money is missing from the house. Things are starting to get out of control and eventually things come to a head. And Ren has to accept the fact that what she's dealing with is a mom who has an addiction to painkillers. So Violets Are Blue is a story about family, first and foremost. It's about forgiveness. It's about secrecy. It's about creativity. It's about passion. But it's about also the tough topics of divorce and addiction. And I've been writing about tough topics for a few years now. Um, in the fall, My Life in the Fish Tank came out, and it's a book about a family dealing with the mental illness of the oldest kid in the family and the effect on the younger kids, um, especially his 12-year-old sister. Maybe He Just Likes You is about sexual harassment in middle school. Um, Everything I Know About You is about a kid discovering a classmate has an eating disorder. Halfway Normal is about a kid returning to school after two years away for cancer treatment. Starcrossed is about a girl discovering her bisexuality in middle school during a production of Romeo and Juliet. So I've been, I've been writing about tough topics for a while and my approach is always the same. It's to include these tough topics, do them justice, um, explore them, open hearts, open minds, get kids talking. But also, my, I, what I want to do is entertain them. So I always include a, as much humor as I can. And I weave in other threads, family, friendship, crushes, school issues, because I think that middle grade readers need a very rich and varied experience. It's very important when you're writing about tough topics that these books for middle grade readers are not one note and they're not heavy or depressing. It's important that these books are entertaining, provocative, interesting, eye-opening, heart and mind opening, but also entertaining. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, next, we'll have Supriya share. Hi, everyone. My name is Supriya Kirakur, and I'm the author of several middle grade books that cover tough topics, including American as Veneer Pie, which covers the tough topics of hate and racism and empowers readers to find their voice in whatever form it may take and speak out against hate through the story of Leica a girl who feels like she has two versions of herself, home Leica who loves watching Bollywood movies and eating Indian food, and school Leica who pins her hair over her bindi birthmark and avoids confrontation at all costs. When a racist incident rocks her small town, Leica must decide whether to continue to remain silent or find her voice and speak out against hate. And my latest middle grade book, there's a poster behind me too, but is That Thing About Bollywood, which covers the tough topic of divorce. For those of you who don't know, Bollywood is the nickname for the Hindi film industry in India. 
And most of these movies are musicals. And I actually worked as a Bollywood screenwriter for over a decade. So that thing about Bollywood is the story of Sonali, a girl who's really bad at expressing her emotions and what she's truly feeling thanks to an incident that happened in her past. And Sonali loves watching old Bollywood movies from the 90s with her family. And those movies are oftentimes really melodramatic and it's pretty obvious what the characters are feeling. In real life, Sonali's parents don't get along and one day they announce they're separating. The next mo morning, Sonali wakes up with her own soundtrack and it's the first of many big changes for her because it turns out she has a magical condition which she calls Bollywooditis, which causes her to express herself in the most obvious way possible through Bollywood song and dance numbers. And as the magic spreads and starts to take over her world, Sonali is in danger of losing her true memories and of her past and the feelings associated with them. So while her family navigates all these changes from the separation and later from the divorce, Sonali has to come to terms with her changing family and their new normal and figure out what's causing the Bollywooditis and put a stop to it before it's too late. So the book deals with magic and fun, but it also deals with divorce and changing families and friendships and illness and the power of finding your voice and expressing all of your emotions in a healthy way. Thank you, Supriya. Hannah, you're up next. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm excited to be here and talk to you about tough topics and uh, I guess I generally write about tough topics related to growing up as a minority, um, specifically as a South Asian Muslim American and everything that comes along with that. Um, but for my characters, their identity isn't their primary struggle. So even though they're like all middle schoolers uh, or middle graders trying to negotiate and adapt and learn how to navigate the world, they are proud of who they are at their core. So the challenges in my characters' lives are really related um, you know, to growing up and figuring themselves out and whether it's dealing with, um, you know, change, like changes in external changes, um, coping with anger, being inhibited, just being confused about something. Um, those are the challenges in their lives, but the tough topics they, they navigate in my books are external and related to, um, let's say misperceptions related to media coverage and ominous song, um, microaggressions and illness and more to the story, um, a hate crime and ominous voice, and I should say in ominous voice, which is the first book in my duology. Um, readers get to know Amina and they meet this shy inhibited girl who has to learn how to take the stage and share her voice with the world. I also introduced this, this hate crime, a mosque vandalism in the book that unfortunately is something that we see with increasing frequency in our country, um, but also as a chance to really model a wonderful response from the community that Amina helps lead. And in Amina's song, the sequel, we get to see Amina continue to, to grow into herself as she matures. Uh, we join her on a journey to Pakistan where she gets to visit family and her beloved uncle who we meet in the first book. Um, and she just falls in love with the country of her heritage that she hasn't visited in a very long time. Um, and you know, can't wait to be home and to share her experiences with her peers and her friends. She actually promises her uncle that when she gets home, she's going to share the beauty of Pakistan with everybody. But when she returns feeling very much transformed and almost like a new person in many ways, she realizes that people not only have limited interest and attention spans, but they also have preconceived notions of what Pakistan is. And she has to really push back against the idea of the single story or narrative and how that shapes our ideas of what a place or a people are. Uh, and she also has to come to understand that, you know, many places in the world or almost all places in the world have ugly parts of their history or terrible events in their past and that doesn't represent the entire place or a people. Uh, Amina has to find a way to creatively get people to think more critically of the world around them and she uses her love for music to bring the parts of her life together in a way that she ultimately feels satisfied with and I just I loved writing this book and getting to continue Amina's journey and I'm excited to share more of her story with readers. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Donna, we'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. I am ridiculously excited to be here with everything. Having been closed down, it's so exciting to be here with everybody, even though we're the only sort of here. Um, first of all, I have to say, Supriya, I just listened to your um, American as Paneer Pie, and I absolutely loved it. It was fantastic. It was really great. Um, and I will get to the books, but first I have to do a cheers to everybody with my mug that I bought from my independent bookstore. Also, in case you're in the mood for this one, which I often am. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, now we'll get on to the tough topics. Um, I have eight middle grade books. The one I'm maybe most well known for right now is Lillian Duncan. It's the story of a transgender girl who is trying to be her authentic self while also trying to save a tree from being cut down. Um, and the tree is named Bob, of course it is. And it's a dual narrative. And it's also about a boy named Duncan who is struggling with bipolar disorder. And there's all kinds of references and information in the back. Okay. My other book that I absolutely love is called In Your Shoes, and this is basically a roadmap on dealing with grief, and it's how creativity and friendship and family can help you find your way back home, and the character is um, writing a fairy tale that mirrors what's happening in the novel, and throughout the book you actually read her fairy tale and of course it takes place in a bowling center and a funeral home because why not my book the paris project is about cleveland rosebud potts and she lives in a tiny town called sassafras florida and she has a six-point plan to get herself out of that town and to paris france which I just found out Mr. Shu is at right now, and I'm incredibly jealous. Um, anyway, she wants to get out because her, you find out that her father was recently incarcerated. And I wrote this book to show the impact on the family when um, a child has an incarcerated parent. There's so many roadblocks and difficulties and challenges that we may not think about. It's almost an invisible problem, and I wanted to make it more visible with this book. And um, also there's a cute dog in the back, so I just have to share that. <laughs> and because it can't all be heavy stuff, I have a brand new picture book out called Go Be Wonderful about a girl who learns that it's okay to be her perfectly imperfect self. And it makes an awesome gift because, wait for it, wait for it, the dust flap is a growth chart. All right, that's it on magic tricks. I will get to the book that I'm excited to talk to you about. Abby Tried and True. It took me 17 years to figure out how to write this book because 17 years ago, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And at that time, my kids were in second and fourth grade. I didn't know, um, you know, if I would make it to see their next birthdays. And it was such a a challenging experience. But what surprised me is that when it was over, that was the hard part. The cards and letters stopped, the visits stopped, the phone calls stopped, and I was really depressed and depleted. And that's kind of when I needed the most help and cheer. So I wanted to tell that part of the story in this book. But I also like to challenge myself in every book. So I kept hearing, you know, don't make it a quiet story. Don't make it a quiet story. And I thought, you know, what if my main character is an introvert? And I researched and found out 33 to 50% of the population are introverts. And I didn't realize I was an introvert till I did this research. And I thought, I'm going to create a really compelling story about an introverted character. So Abby um, expresses her feelings through poetry that appear in the book. And she has a turtle, of course, named Fudge as an homage to Judy Bloom. And fortunately, she has this very gregarious big brother. So she doesn't have to be the loud one. She has this great big brother who's the loud, fun one. And when he is diagnosed with testicular cancer, suddenly he becomes more serious and not as fun. And Abby has to dig deep into herself to find the ways that she can shine as an introvert and still be there for her brother. And what can she do to help her family, help her two moms and um, 
her big extended Jewish family is there. And it's this warm, loving book. And because every book that I write that's hard ends with hope. This book absolutely positively ends on a hopeful note. Thanks. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, I'm so excited to jump into the panel discussion. So uh, I, I found that what was really great about reading all of your books is that they do such a beautiful job of explanation and exploration of tough topics without the tough topics being overwhelming. And thank you, Barbara, for explaining that you, know, you also want to entertain um, in your books as well. Can you talk um, a little more about how you decide how much to explain or even give an example of a, a time in your book when you, you had to think that through. And if we could begin with Hannah, that would be great. Uh, sure. So I think, you know, as Barbara expressed so nicely, like ultimately we write books to, you know, to entertain kids and to get them excited about reading and to want to keep reading. And, you know, but at the same time, I feel like they are, all of us, and especially kids too, are dealing with real life challenges all the time. So I do think it is striking that balance of introducing things that they may already be hearing about, thinking about, coping with um, in a story without, you know, weighing them down and making them feel, you know, more anxious or depressed or, <laughs> or overwhelmed by the world. Um, and I think, you know, Donna hit it on the head by, by mentioning the word hope. And I think that's really, um, for me, part of it is, is even as I'm my characters are grappling with something challenging or heavy or, you know, feels like the world is crashing down around them, that in those moments, there's still levity, there's still light, there's still humor and, and, and love. And I think that's what, what gets them through, um, just like we see in, in life. Um, and so for me, it's, um, you know, it's always that, that balance of um, a heavy scene, maybe something, um, you know, sort of gut wrenching, you know, with a lighter moment or a tender moment or, you know, a, a moment of really of, of quiet reflection and, and feeling something. Um, and, and I think, you know, all of us, we, we write these topics because we, we believe in kids and their ability to, um, you know, understand things and not be talked down to and to, you know, to grapple with the, the questions that we we continue to grapple with as, as adults. Um, so I feel like for me, it's, it's um, you know, I, I don't think I've ever left anything out of a book that I've wanted to, to put in. You know, I, I feel like it's just a matter of striking that balance and making sure that it doesn't, it doesn't feel too heavy. Um, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, they're kids. So there's other stuff going on in, in their lives and they're, they're self-centered <laughs> because all kids are. And so the world revolves around them. So, you know, even when big other things are happening, they, they're still, you know, the friendships and, and, you know, things that they're excited to do in their life and, and, and school or summer vacation or whatever it is going around them. So I think it, in a way it's, it's easier because they're, they're kids and kids are resilient and amazing. Um, so um, I, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> I think I went off on the tangent, but um, it's about balance for me. Definitely. And that made me think of when you say balance, um, Supriya reading uh, that thing about Bollywood and having these, you know, cinematic scenes and also the really heavy stuff of the parents fighting. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So like, like Donna said, um, you know, a big part of what we have to do is to entertain our, our younger readers too. So they want to keep reading and get to the end of our story. Um, so I, I was able to, with this device of Bollywooditis, um, you know, tackle these tough topics in sometimes humorous ways. Um, you know, Sonali goes on a field trip and that's when the magic first strikes in a really big way. And, um, it makes her sing about all her fears in front of her entire class. And she's jumping and dancing around um, the mountains in Los Angeles and singing all her deepest fears out to everybody. And, um, you know, as the character is mortified, the reader is hopefully entertained. You know, we can cringe along with her, but it's also sort of funny. Um, but um, thanks to the magic, I was able to really explore really hurtful and painful moments like Sonali watching her parents fight almost her entire life. All she can remember is them constantly yelling at each other or arguing with each other until one day 
they sort of stop speaking to each other, which almost feels worse for her. Um, so, um, you know, it's a balance, like Hannah said, between um, getting to those tough topics and entertaining. And um, I, I hope I did it all right in, in the book. Thank you. Another thing that I noticed the books all had in common was about how characters are able to and um, are navigating how to use their voices, which definitely I see as a teacher of middle schoolers. Uh, that's something that they're all going through right now. Um, can you speak to why that was an important uh, theme in your book and maybe give an example? Um, let's start with Donna this time. Hi. Um, so as I said, in Abby tried and true, she's very much an introvert. And, you know, in our society, introverts are not prized. It is usually the louder person that is paid attention to whether or not they have the best ideas. So she doesn't feel very good about herself. And it, it takes most of the book until she gets into a situation where she has to use her voice. She, like she has to use her voice to save someone. And she's so conflicted because she feels like she is this quiet person who can't use her voice. And, and of course, of course she finds her voice and she uses it and she realizes it, that there's all kinds of positive things about being exactly who she is. And she can be a quiet person and be loud when she needs to be. And I think, Oh my gosh, in middle school, we are so unsure. We are trying to navigate this territory that is so unfamiliar with one foot in childhood and one foot in adulthood. And we're not sure that, that people care about what we have to say. We, we think we're the only people in the world who are dealing with whatever the thing is that we're dealing with. And I think the most important thing, the, the essence of why I write for kids that age is to let them know that they're not alone. And once you let them know that they're not alone, then they feel a little bit stronger and a little bit more comfortable. And then they feel like they can use their voice. Thank you. And I noticed that theme also in uh, your book, uh, My Life in the Fish Tank, Barbara, and you're happy and I'm, I'm happy to hear about your other books as well. But, um, you know, one of the main characters has a really close relationship with a science teacher, but is also hiding away from the rest of the world. So uh, could you share with us a little bit about that? Oh, you're muted, Barbara. Can you hear me now? Okay, so in my life in the fish tank, um, the main character has, uh, she's 12 years old and her brother is a college freshman. And when he goes off to college, he um, has a self-destructive incident and is as a result of that diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And it puts the family in a tailspin and the parents tell the th three other kids that they should keep their brother's um, situation private which to the main character Zinni sounds the same as secret. And so she feels as if she has a secret that she can't share. She can't speak about it to her friends. She can't speak about it to her teachers. Um, and, and it becomes overwhelming to her because, um, you know, she loves her brother very much and she's worried. And she also just wants to share this experience. And she also starts to think it's unfair that her, her parents are... Um, putting this burden of secrecy on her. So eventually she confronts her parents about it. I write about um, needing to use your voice a lot. That's what um, Maybe He Just Likes You is about. Mila in Maybe He Just Likes You is being um, targeted for sexual harassment in seventh grade. And she tries, she's not a shy kid and she tries to speak up at the beginning. She really fights back and she says no. And she's, you know, she tries to advocate her, for herself, but she doesn't know how to do it effectively. And the book is about her learning how to be heard, learning how to speak the language that the boys are going to understand and hear and respect. Um, and in, um, in Violets Are Blue, the main character, Ren, can't speak because um, when her parents split up, her, she's very close to her mom, and her mom um, is not happy about the fact that her dad's remarried this beautiful younger woman and doesn't want them talking 
behind her back, she says. So she tells her daughter, don't talk about me. Don't gossip about me to your dad and to his beautiful young new wife. Um, so when things start to happen at home that are troubling, Ren feels that she can't tell her dad about it because that would be betraying her mom and, and their agreement that Ren not speak about it. So, you know, all of these characters are struggling with how to be heard, how to use their voice, how you know not to hurt other people by speaking up, but how to advocate for themselves. And the, one of the reasons I write about this is because kids this age really feel as if they often feel it, that they have no control over their lives and what they have is their voice. You know, they have their perceptions because they're starting to separate from their parents and look at their parents subjectively and maybe critically. Um, they look at their world with with question marks um, and they they can't control necessarily their their lives or their situations, but they can think their thoughts and they can speak up if they know how to do it effectively and appropriately. So. That's what a lot of these stories are about for me. Thank you. Um, Hannah and Supriya, you're welcome to chime in if you have anything you wanna add. Hannah, did you wanna go? Otherwise, I can. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, all right. So um, I, I grew up in a town that didn't value diversity. We had a rock thrown through our window. Microaggressions and racism were a, really a daily part of my school life. And because of all the racial bullying, my voice was really silenced when I was growing up. And I didn't find my voice until college when I realized it took the form of my writing. And I think because of my lived experiences with those tough topics, my books are about finding your voice. So American has been your pie has many autobiographical moments in it as like her journeys to find her voice. But unlike me, she finds her voice in middle school and is able to speak out against hate in her town in this really um, conflict filled election year where um, you know racism is really brewing and xenophobia is on, on the rise. And in the case of that thing about Bollywood, Sonali's voice comes in the form of finally being able to express herself and talk to her parents about how she really feels about all the years of their fighting that she's had to witness and their changing family with the divorce. Um, and of course, she also expresses her voice through her song and dance numbers. But I, I really want kids who are experiencing those tough life experiences to know that they're not alone and that they're seen and that there is great power in their voice. And I hope that my books help readers feel that. Oh, I love that. I love that so much. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel very similar. Um, and my, my experience growing up, I, I wasn't outright bullied, but I did grow up feeling invisible and in that I didn't have a voice. And I think uh, my characters like yours are, are almost, you know, aspirational or, or what I, what I wish I would have been like. And, you know, one thing I, I think about a lot is, you know, I was, I was a shy inhibited child. So I share that with Amina. Um, I gave her this beautiful musical gift that I don't have, but, you know, the whole idea that kids can find their voice in different ways. And, you know, for some, for one child, it may be music for another, it may be, you know, something completely different, but, you know, there's so many outlets. And when I talk to kids at school visits, um, you know, even about finding your voice, I, I try to remind them that there's so many different ways of expressing yourself and, and putting yourself out there. And it's not, you know, I talk to kids about writing a lot and I get a lot of, oh, I, I'm not a good writer and I don't know how to spell. And, you know, they, they're, they're so quick to um, put themselves down or, you know, limit themselves sometimes. And, you know, just the whole idea that, um, you know, like Supriya said, that when the more you see the possibility and different ways that kids are um, pushing themselves or finding themselves in situations where they need to speak up or they feel compelled to, you know, express themselves in different ways and, and use their voice for something positive. Um, I feel like hopefully kids will start to see different, different examples and, and ways of, of being able to do that themselves or feel more confident than, than I did as a kid. Thank you. I think this discussion about voice is so important, especially after uh, the year and a half that we have lived and are still living through the pandemic. Uh, a lot of kids have felt really isolated. Um, a lot of people in general have felt really isolated. And so 
I wonder if you could talk about how uh, this time has made your books even more resonant, if you've had um, any uh, sort of questions from teachers or readers that you've received that have really uh, surprised you or taught you even something new about your book that you hadn't even um, thought about. So um, I see you nodding, Donna. So would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I want to start by saying the thing, the thing that I want to reference happened right before the pandemic. So my, my last school visit before everything shut down, I did my presentation and I have one sentence where I say, and my parents were divorced and then I go on. And then I do this whole presentation, you know, and at the very end, as will sometimes happen, you know, I had a little line of kids and this one girl, she waited till everybody else was gone. And I knew that I needed to really pay attention to her. And she looked at me and she said, I'm so sorry that your parents got divorced. Now this happened when I was seven, I'm 56 now. And I looked at her and I said, are your parents divorced? She starts to hitch up and she's nodding. And she looks like she's gonna cry. And I said, do you need a hug? And you know, and I gave her a big hug. And it's, these moments are everything with school visits. So the most important things that that, girl felt seen and heard and understood and comforted and not alone. And then the pandemic and honestly, everything shut down for me. I, I mean, other than a few online things, I didn't have the chance to make those connections. So what I tried to do during the pandemic was, you know, send as many books out as I could to teachers and librarians who were trying to bring them to the kids' homes because when we can't be there, our books can be there, our characters can be there. They can be friends for these kids like they were for us when we were kids and they can provide some kind of safe haven and some kind of escape during all of this. So I think that our books are more important than ever now during this difficult time. Can I say something? Um, hi, yeah, um, so, <laughs> um, I have heard that um, during the pandemic that there have been discussions about maybe he just likes you with kids participating who hadn't participated on Zoom all year long. Um, and that's great because what we want to do is to, you know, write the kinds of books that spark these conversations. That's, they're really important. But I, I had something like what Donna is talking about happen that I just wanted to mention. I did um, a mega Zoom with um, several schools at once. And I won't say where it is, it's in the Midwest. Um, it was about a thousand kids. They had all read, maybe he just likes you. And um, after they had read it, I spoke to about a thousand kids, but I couldn't see any of them because it was such a big Zoom that when they had questions, it got you know fed through their teachers. So um, I was on camera and I, we, I answered their questions and when, when it was over, um, a couple of months later, I got an email from one of the teachers who said, I just wanted to tell you that when you had your Zoom with us, um, when it was over, one of my students came to me and said that she wanted to talk to the teacher about how um, since the age of five, she had been sexually abused by her grandfather and she never felt comfortable talking about it until she read this book and heard me speak about it. And now she wanted to talk about it. And as a result of this, the teacher sprang into action. And to make a long story short, this relative is now in jail and the family is getting counseling and the girl will be okay. So the teacher said to me, I just wanted to thank you for writing a book that provoked this conversation, sparked this conversation that the student had with me. And what I said to the teacher was, you know, we can write books about tough topics. We can bring up these issues, but you provided a space that the student felt comfortable talking to you about, you know, we're just, we're just starting the conversation with our books. 
And it's one thing for a kid to read our books under the covers with a flashlight, you know, that's an important experience. And it's very important for the kid to feel seen when, when he or she does that and make a connection with a book that's very intimate and personal and, and important. But what's even better is when a book starts a conversation with a trusted adult or with classmates or with family members. And when a teacher makes a classroom a safe place where these conversations can happen, that's the best thing in the world. So, you know, we are all in this together. You know, we're all on the same team and we're all trying to get kids reading and talking and thinking, but we're all doing it together. That's a tough, um, <laughs> so tough act to follow, but that's, that's an amazing, amazing story. Um, and those, those moments are, are incredible um, for us as, as the creators of these stories. But I guess um, for me, one thing I just wanted to mention about the pandemic was, you know, just, it, I think it, in, for, for all of us, it really highlighted so much um, inequity and you know injustice that maybe some of us hadn't been paying attention to before, and it just sort of brought everything up. Um, and that coupled with you know a really um, divisive election, you know, there was just a lot for all of us to cope with. And what I found was that you know people were searching for, and I you know I was and I was heartened by a lot of the response to to books and you know to anti Asian hate and to Islamophobia and and other um, you know challenges we face as a society, but that there was this um, surge and in interest and and support for for authors. Um, and, and their work. And, and so that was, that was really encouraging for me, you know, in the midst of this really terrible moment <laughs> or, you know, period of, of history, that there was this rallying around stories and the power of narrative in particular, and, and its ability to, to open up minds and to promote empathy and to just be, um, you know, surrounded by people who believe in that. So, so fiercely was so uh, encouraging, you know, when things looked so bad. Um, I'm sure you all had those moments where you're like, wow, I'm part of this amazing community of educators and librarians and, and parents and people who just want to make a difference and they're turning to books for this. And, um, you know, I received beautiful notes of support and, um, you know, just, just fan mail or whatever it is, just to tell me how much um, they people were connecting with my story. And that, that's what got me through um, the last year and a half. Thank you. Uh, Spriya, did you want to add anything? Um, I, I think it's all been said here. Thank you. Great, because we have a lot of really excellent uh, questions from our audience. So, um, one question that's been asked um, about five times, so um, an important question, um, is what advice do you have for teachers sharing your books with students, um, but who will receive pushback from parents or community members about the content or characters in the books? And I know we have tons of teachers and librarians on. So um, have you come across this? Um, have people talked to you about pushback in any of your books? Um, and do you have any advice? Um, you know, I think um, we have to always remember that um, our peers have a diverse um, number of experiences. People are experiencing things that we may not have encountered growing up. Kids are experiencing these things. So there's a certain amount of privilege with being able to say, well, I don't want to share certain topics with my students or a, a parent, if a parent says that because I guarantee there's someone in your school who is experiencing what our books cover. So, um, you know, we a lot of us didn't have a choice whether or not we experienced these things as kids. So I, I think we have to sort of push back um, to that privilege and confront it a little and challenge it. And, um, you know, th there are kids who need these stories. And even if you haven't experienced it, your peers have, and it helps you grow your empathy and care for your friends and your classmates who are going through these issues. Um, my book, Lily and Duncan, has uh, been on the banned book list. It's 
had um, it's been on TV news and newspapers in ways that you know you don't really want. And um, some of the things that have helped uh, the people on the front lines, the librarians and the teachers who are trying to put these important books into kids' hands and make it available for kids, is I know with the libraries that there were procedures in place so that when a complaint arose, they, they could follow a procedure. They didn't have to make a decision on the spot. There was usually a board of people who made the decision and they made it based on um, the merits of the book. So, you know, go ahead and see if the book has starred reviews, if it has, um, you know, sometimes the publisher offers some uh, supplements and information in that way. It's, it's so, I, I so feel for the teachers and the librarians who have to face that backlash, but I just have to share that I have gotten so many letters, emails, photographs, of people who they they literally said that this book has saved a child's life because they saw themselves in the book because they felt less alone. Um, I, I could just go on and on about the stories that I hear as the author about how important this book and you never know who needs this book. You never know. And it is not only the people that find themselves represented one of the most touching letters that I ever got was from an eighth grade girl. And she said, I don't feel like I'm like Lily or Duncan, but because I read your book, I am more compassionate and empathetic to the Lily and Duncans of the world. And to me, that is everything. So teachers and librarians keep fighting. You're doing great work. Thank you. It's all about finding those mirrors and windows in books, right? Um, for uh, students to see themselves and to see others and to understand more. So um, another conversation, another question that's been asked a few times uh, is about boys. And I know um, the books that you've talked about um, have a lot of uh, really great, strong female characters, um, but I have some questions wondering about if you talk about any um, boys or if there are boy main characters that you could share um, about your own books. And anyone can chime in about boys. <laughs> all right, I'll just pop in really quickly. Um, in Abby Tried and True, Abby has to go through all these hard things. So of course, when her best friend who lives next door moves away, I have the person who moves into that space to rent the house is a boy just a year older than her. And I intentionally made him this gentle and sensitive yet sporty guy um, to the point where when Abby gets her first kiss, he asks for consent in the cutest way. And I wanted this available for young boys reading this to just see a role model of how they can be, that they can have rich emotional lives, that it's absolutely okay, that they don't need to listen to society and shut themselves down. And I think it's so important that we model those kinds of kids in our books. So if they don't get it anywhere else, at least they would get it here. I'll jump in too. I, I love writing boy characters. Um, in More to the Story, um, he's not featured on the cover because this is a little women inspired novel, but my favorite character to write was Ali, who is the Lori equivalent um, and just digging into his character. But in, in Amina's song, um, I really loved exploring a new friendship that she develops with a boy, um, Nico, who shares her love for music and um, of course, being a middle grader and also just because of her, her background and some of the taboos around, you know, girl boy relationships, she's, she's sort of fed um, opinions then that sort of make her start to question what, what her relationship with Nico really is. And is it, is it friendship? Is it, is he a friend? Is he a friend, friend, right? <laughs> All that stuff. And, um, and it was just really fun to write, but, but like Donna said, I loved writing um, of just a really thoughtful, um, perceptive kid who um, ends up being just the friend that Amina needs at this time where 
um, you know, in middle school where kids can sometimes be changing. And even though she maintains strong relationships with her girlfriends, you know, there's their interests are sort of diverging and just learning to accept that that's okay. Um, and making space for, for new people in your life when you need them um, was a fun thing to explore. Thank you. I like Nico too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we only have a few more minutes uh, to answer questions. So here, I would like to ask a question to all of you and um, the uh, other attendees have been asking it too. Are there other tough topic books that you um, are reading or could recommend? And some folks have asked uh, if there is a tough topic book from when you were growing up that really helped you. So if everyone could share and we'll start with Supriya. Um, I am reading Finding Junie Kim right now by Ellen O. Oh, Hannah has it up. <laughs> and um, Hannah probably has something special to tell you about that book. <laughs> but um, I, I am a third of the way in. I had to take a break because I went on vacation. And I just love Junie's voice in that book and um, the way Ellen tells this story. Thank you. Um, Hannah, since you have it already, yeah. Yeah, talk about <laughs> when you it. mentioned it, I, I reached behind me and I pulled it off because I, I just love this cover so much too. Um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful story that, you know, does deal with mental health challenges with the Korean War, you know, really heavy topics, but in a way that is still very accessible and, you know, has humor and it's a beautiful book. Um, I also really enjoyed Unsettled by Reem Faruqi. It's her debut middle grade, um, which deals with immigration and, um, you know, being new to America, which um, was also really, really nicely done and sort of reminiscent of Other Words, from Ho Other Words for Home by um, Jasmine Marga, which I adore. Thank you. Barbara? Um, well, I love um, Fighting Words by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. Um, also um, by Paula Chase, So Done, Doughboys and Turning Point, which is a trilogy, really. Um, I, I love her writing. It's, 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 it just pops off the page. It's just got so much life in it. And also um, by Aida Salazar, The Moon Within and Land of the Cranes. Beautiful. Thank you. Donna? Barbara, you took my book. I was going to say Fighting Words, such a fabulous book. Right, right. Um, so many good, there's so many, but I, this book always, I keep coming back to Otherwood by Pete Hotman. It's one of the most beautiful, heart-rending books about what it is to um, leave your childhood behind. And it's, it's just, it's fabulous, just a fabulous book. When I was a kid, um, I used to go to school and I didn't have we didn't have much money. My parents were divorced and um, my mom worked full time, but because she was a woman in the seventies, we didn't have much money. And I would often wear the same thing to school every day. So the book, the hundred dresses resonated with me and it stayed so deeply in my heart and it had such a creative ending. And I was like, ah, that's me. And then also that's not a tough topic book at all. I love Mr. Popper's Penguins because when I was going through hard things at home, you know, my parents fighting, doors being slammed, I needed to get away. So we need books like that too, fun fantasy books that take you away from everything. Thank you. Um, this is a question, actually there are a bunch of questions about um, advice to teachers about how to approach um, teaching your books, or I know there are reading guides um, as well um, for the books, but is there an entry point question or a way to talk about them? We've um, gotten that question a bunch of times in different ways in the chat. Barbara, did you wanna start? Sure, um, you know, a, a lot of times I think, um, teachers and adults in general, parents certainly may be uncomfortable talking about some of these topics, like for example, sexual harassment. And so it's great when you can talk about characters in a work of fiction, because then people don't feel threatened and you're not pointing fingers and nobody's tattling on anybody. So if you read a book, like maybe he just likes you, you can say, why did this character behave this way? Why did this character make this choice? Um, how did this character feel about that? What other things could this character have done differently? Um, and then, you know, it just, it just makes, you're, you're talking about the topic, but you're not talking about the people in the room. Um, 
and and things come up inevitably but it's just it just makes everybody feel more comfortable about the topic if the topic is a little bit sensitive or tricky thank you any other advice or help I'll just add that when I when I was in a panel with educators once I was asked you know how and they were speaking about I guess my, my books in general and even my picture books that you know may introduce Islam or Islamic traditions and, and, and culture and the question was you know I want to teach these topics but um, how do I keep how do I keep the conversation from going off the rails and I feel like that that is a, a concern that many times people have with what any of these topics, you know, sort of like, how do I contain it? But I think maybe staying within, like like uh, Barbara mentioned, you know, just keeping it about the book and about the character and about, you know, what you could do or about, you know, research or, you know, other things that are very concrete um, rather than getting into abstracts or into, you know, opinions or, you know, things like that um, is a way to sort of center it. And I think if you are, you are already have this construct to work in, um, which I think, can maybe make it a little less intimidating. Thank you. Um, Donna, did you wanna add something? One of the things that I think is important is to, first of all, just to speak comfortably about the topic yourself and then, um, you know, maybe give a teaser, just tell what the book's about, read a couple pages of it. And then I think what's really important is don't shelve it in some separate place, you know, difficult topics or whatever. Shelve it within all the other books um, and then, you know, let the student who needs that book find it and feel comfortable because they're not going to some special section, you know. I think that that's important to think about. Sapriya. Yeah, I think um, I don't have much to add to all those great suggestions. Sometimes reading guides do have pre-reading questions that can help um, readers prepare, but I, I just love Donna's idea of just shelving it with all the other books and treating it like all the other books because it, it is going to be a normal book to many of your students. And also, I would say you just never know when it's going to come up for them. I didn't know that um, my son was going to ask me about divorce. Um, and I, I find a really great approach is to ask them questions like, what do you what do you want to know about drug addiction? What do you want to know um, about divorce or um, mental illness? And I think your books have all um, really started a lot of conversation in my house and in my classroom. And so I thank you so much um, for this wonderful discussion. And I think I'm going to go to Molly for closing remarks now. Well, thank you so much. We are just about out of time. And I want to thank you all for such a fantastic discussion and conversation this evening. We would also like to thank the sponsor of this webinar, Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing. Thank you for joining us this evening on a summer night, listening in and sharing your questions. Um, for those who registered to attend this live event, we will choose a name at random to receive a free copy of our featured titles from our panelists. We'll notify the winner by email in the next few days. And a quick reminder that all registered attendees will have access to download an e-gallery of Violets Are Blue by Barbara D. In addition, several resources have been shared in the chat in this, uh, this evening, and we will post these resources on our website in the next five business days, just in case you missed them here. A post-event email will be sent out um, containing the same information. And as a reminder, the recording of this webinar will be available um, directly after on our Facebook page, in addition to closed captioning recording, which will be available within 10 days on our YouTube channel. Please keep an eye on the ILA Digital Events webpage, literacyworldwide.org forward slash digital events for additional on-demand content and upcoming webinars and learning opportunities. On Tuesday, September 14th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, join us for supporting multilingual learners with translanguaging strategies. Translanguaging, a practice that allows for flexibility in how bilingual and multilingual learners express themselves and make meaning, welcome student home languages as assets in the classroom. This ILA intensive 
hosted by Dr. Rabia Haas, for, focuses on translanguaging studies strategies that support learners ages 12 and up. Keynote speakers include Dr. Ophelia Garcia, the leading scholar whose work has brought translanguaging to the forefront of multilingual instruction, and Dr. Kate Seltzer a co-author of Garcia's, whose research interests are rooted in her experiences teaching emergent bilingual high school students. Featured session speakers will model specific strategies on classroom-ready instructional ideas, family engagement, and more. Participants will take away clear, concrete ideas for implementing a translanguaging design for literacy instruction, one that not only acknowledges, but also embraces the full linguistic repertoire of multilingual learners. And in case you missed it, the ILA at home webinar featuring Donalyn Miller is still available to view on demand through August 30th. In this ILA digital event, Donalyn describes conditions, rituals, and instructional opportunities that engage young people with reading and set them on the path to joyful reading for a lifetime. And finally, if you missed it, check out our ILA Children's Literature Intensive hosted by Dr. Tiffany A. Flowers, where we focus on the next step after curating a diverse collection, incorporating culturally relevant and responsive children's literature in meaningful ways. This event features 20 plus authors through a mix of live and async sessions, panels, conversations, and keynotes. And if you're not already following ILA on social media, make sure to do so for the most up-to-date information. Thank you again for your time tonight.